before my boss sees it. And a lot of that is working with QML. And if you've done any QML, the first thing you find is problems with binary loops and you don't know how to solve them. So I'm going to give, talk about three different things, writing declaratively, what your binary loop means, because I think it's been so confusing, because I get to see other plasma developers talking about things and getting some things wrong. And most importantly, how to use GDB with QML, because I use GDB for any time I have a problem. If there's a binary loop, GDB. If you don't know why a property is being called, form some JavaScript, GDB. If you want to look busy at work, open GDB. <laughs> so while I'm giving this talk, I'm going to go over some genuine IRC quotes from Half Plasma. And I've redacted the names so you don't see, so I don't show who said them. So, subtle. <laughs> So one thing people say is, it's a false positive, it's a false positive, there's no way I have a problem. My code's perfect. Because it looks like it works, sometimes. Also, you get a bug report. I've got an error. I mean, you go, I don't have an error. Yeah, that's why you're wrong. And the last, the most mysterious myth in QML bindings is that I like fixing them. <laughs> they don't get sent my way, which is why I'm giving a talk so I don't have to do it again. So, Writing the cloud to code. You're giving this talk, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> the cloud to code is very different from the regular code. This is going to backfire. <laughs> You're going to backfire. <laughs> now, the cloud to code, you don't write procedural statements. This happens, then this happens, then this happens. What you're writing is a set of states. And is Wikipedia's random what thing about what the cloud to code means? And you can read that for yourself. But the important part is, it's not procedural. You're just saying, here are my set of states, at any given time, all of these states should be true. All of the expressions in my code should be true. It should match what I told it to be. So, you're not writing in code, you're writing states. And whenever you change anything, you get this tree of events happening. You change one property, that will change another property, that will change one or two or three more properties, and it becomes a chain of events, not a chain of events. A tree of events. And that's what happens every time a property changes. You get this tree happening. So binding loops are when your tree looks like this, which is a stupid shape for a tree. <laughs> I'm not into botany, but I know it's wrong. So, the technical reason of what a binding loop actually means it means when I've been evaluating a binding loop, I've evaluated it, I've told everyone, here's my new function, here's my new value, you should update all of your bindings, it ends up updating itself. And that's a technical thing of a binding loop. And the British translation of that is, your code is stupid. And there's no other answer to that. So we're going to go through a very simple binding loop. We have two properties. A defines B, B defines A plus 1. And that's kind of like saying, who is the tallest person in the world? Tallest person in the world, or a person taller than him. It sounds like a good Chinese proverb, but it's just a stupid sentence. And the answer is Bolka. Now, so if we go back to this code, what is the result of A and B on initialization? I don't think anyone looking at it can know the answer except for a few KDAP people. It could be a both end point, one's infinity, one to one, the other's zero. In fact, the answer is, if you do run it, both are set to 1. Despite the fact that B should always be bigger than A, both are set to 1. So, you're in this bizarre corrupt state. And even if you don't end up in a corrupt state, which is possible, you're not always corrupted, but your code is still difficult to follow because, logically, it doesn't make any sense. So, when you see the error message, you get something like this. QML that finally detected from property A. So you know where it is, but it's a useless error message, which is why it's in confusion. Because what it doesn't tell you is what triggered all of this event leading to A changing. And it doesn't tell you what happened between A changing once and all of the things that happened before A ended up changing again. And that's the problem with this error message. It tells you something went wrong here, but you have no stack trace before, you have no stack trace in that point between where it works out the binding and when it works out the binding again. 
So it's a completely just error message. So we're going to go over some examples of some QNL code. It's not real QNL code, but it's problems that we've seen before in Plasma. So if you have this code, the property B defined to, if it's Monday, it's A plus 1, and why is it 0? Is this a binary? Well, today it's not. <laughs> <laughs> If it's all scheduled on a different day, that would be. And that's important to, not this specific case, but when you're doing binary loops in general, even if you get a bug report, it is a one-time check. And the fact that a one-time check is important, it doesn't feed ahead and magically work out, oh, you might be using A, it might be using B, and predict a future, which I think has been some confusion that that's what happens. It's simply what after the fact, after you've had the problem, that you get the warning. And this is another example where it happens quite a lot, we saw in Plasma, where we've seen something like, is this a binary loop? We're setting a width to a value plus a margin. Now, that shouldn't be a binary loop. It's just a value plus a margin. Until we look at C++ code, where every time a geometry changes, we emit a signal saying, this other value has changed. So it's important that even though your binary loop error comes up in QML, or your program is in QML, your error might not be in QML. It might mean any of the things you're calling. So just seeing the logs of QML are useless, you need to see your logs together. And final question, is this a binary loop? We don't have any bindings, instead we've got two functions, two handlers, which say when a value changes, change the other value. And it's the exact same code as before with A and B and A plus 1. Is this a binary loop? It's not, it's a, it's a stack overflow. Because it's not detected. It's only a binary loop that has a detection. It will just stack overflow and it will. So, even the same problem you see with binary loops can happen in different ways. And they're even harder to be bugged because you can't even attach gamma ray because of this patch. So, I'm going to quickly show you what QQML binding looks like inside. It's a very simplified because there's three different types of binding, but we're not in that. Also, it doesn't use signals because it's fancy. But effectively, this is the code for QQML binding. It works out a new value and it makes it changed. The binding loop detection works as follows. It sets a flag. It works out a new value that unsets a flag. And if this method is called twice on the same object, you get a warning message. It's just very simple code, and the problem we have in Plasma is people overcomplicate what this does. It's Boolean flag, people think it's something clever. But when you understand, that's all it's doing. Seeing it as a Boolean flag to see how it has the same instance of a QQML binding been evaluated twice from inside the binding. And the code for Q binding is really simple, you can read it, unless you look at the new classes. So your takeaway, it's not clever. Also, it shows you can't have a false positive. It's not really in head, it's, if you see that error message, it's because you have a binary loop. But that isn't to say all binary loops would necessarily cause you to explode, but programmatically your code, at the very best, a bit weird. So, move on to the most common causes. Realistically, most of the problems are caused by this one thing, sizing. And the problem is, there's so many different ways to set a size. It's letters, it's anchors, it can be set it explicitly, and the other random bits of code will also come in and think, I'm going to change that. Cubic controls will do it, Cubic gallery randomly resizes a few things, scroll bars will do it, and you have a lot of these external things changing them. And it's something the Cubic people had in mind when they developed it, because there is a solution sort of baked in. We have two properties. Implicit width and width. An implicit width is the size the item wants to be, and a width is the size the item actually is. And if you use these two properties, generally you have fewer problems. If you use them properly. Yeah, so, yeah. If, if I look at the plasma logs and I see uh, binding loops on implicit width, right? So it doesn't solve it. <laughs> um, I said if they use properly. Yeah. Also, there is one binding loop left in plasma. And there was a bug report saying exactly where it is. And it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, generally, in 
implicit width is generated by a size of your children. And your children will have an implicit width, and your size of this item comes from the size of your children. Whereas the width of your children comes from the size of your parents. Because if you imagine a window, the user can be size of the window. But, so that needs to propagate from the top down, whereas the implicit size, the size of a button, the size of an icon, that's done in your children, and that propagates upwards to the uh, implicit size of your window. So, implicit what size goes up to your parent, size can go down from your parent to the bottom. And this is a good general rule, that if you have two properties, if you have a property that is manipulated externally, but it's also something you're trying to set yourself, you need to have two properties. And that's a cause of a lot of problems, and it needs to be done when you first create the items in your initial coding. You have to think, who is going to be updating this? Is it users of this item or other objects around the scene? So, now we move on to the second part of the talk, which is somewhat separate, but it's not purely about language. Debugging anything with GDB, if you first try using a debugging Qt application, you print an object, you print a Qstring, and you just see a D pointer, which you can't evaluate, and it's useless. But hopefully most of you are familiar with pretty printing. And pretty printing means you find some magic things, and you can see the real values. You can see your real text in a Qstring. And for anything in Qtbase, there's a lovely set of scripts in here that if you haven't got them, you should take a photo of this slide and make sure you run this script because it's essential to life. Um, it's very important. And one thing I didn't realise for a long time was every time you need to update your Qt, you have to rerun this. So, this is awesome. It prints all your Qstrings. Q variants, the Q list, and it's very good for anything in Qbase. But when you come to anything in Qcloud, it's useless. And it just isn't generating anything in there, and it's a lot harder. And it's a lot harder for a few reasons. If you look at the stack trace from anything with Qquick, it just looks like garbage. It's just used V4, V4 execution, blah, blah, blah. Your data is literally stored in these binary pack blobs that you can't easily decode. Even the basic types are wrapped. Your Q object has this object wrapper where the property offsets don't match the Q object metal objects, and you can get into a world of confusion there. And most importantly, your locations in your code don't match the locations in your QML file. You will see, oh, I'm on QQML binding line 1023 doesn't tell you which part of the code you've written, it is. And when you want any kind of backtrace, you need to be able to see where my code is, not some interpreter's code. And the good part is, you can extract the values. And you're not going to remember any of the things I said in my slides, but you will remember, hopefully, that you can get this data, and you can look it up, and that's useful. So, tracing bindings. Going back to binding loops because they're useful, it's a good example of most things. To get a backtrace of a binding, break when you see a warning message. And breaking when you see a warning message is a good way to find out why that binding was generated in the first place. And this works for bindings, it doesn't work for object creation because that happens in a different thread and there's a delayed error. But binding loops just works perfectly. So if we have a Example of something with a binding loop, don't need to go through the XML, but this has a binding loop. When you see a backtrace, it, as I said, it looks like a gibberish. There's some of it's readable, a lot of it isn't. Keep in mind, you've got no data in there. You can vaguely see it's a cubic item and then get like size of being set, but that's not clear in all cases. But the event, most important useful one is this one, QQML binding update, because QQML binding has a link back to your original dev, to your original QML file. It says where that expression is. So from our GDB, we can select frame one, and we can run functions, we can say print expression identifier, and that tells us exactly which file which line is. And that's very useful because Plasma has 120,000 lines of QML. 
And even if you know what object type it is, you really want to know which file it's in and which line. And that's normally enough to get you in the right set. And we can go through all the different frames which say QQML line public and triple find this. And that gives us line 4, then it went on to drop down line 6, then it went on to buy on line 4. And then you can see that new pattern because you have by on line 4 got evaluated twice. So you can see your QPML binding stack trace, which is very useful for developing loop. And I wrote a tool that wraps all of this up in a very simple script, and Thomas McGuire was sharing it on some forums, a proper KDAV guy, and I was quite proud of it until I found it useless. And the reason it's useless is because it does what I told it to, not anything useful. We can see exactly what binding is different, but you can't see all the other C++ that happened. You can't see anything else not a binding. And they're very important for debugging any issues. So even if Gamma Ray gets a tool for debugging bindings, you still need to, I think, use GDB and go through this technique. So JS functions, JavaScript functions. JavaScript functions also have a callback to where the code is. So every time you see, I'm speeding up off that a little time, uh, QV is your set simple call. You can grab this function call, call QV for stack trace, and you can get a JavaScript stack trace of everything that's happening in your JavaScript stack. And no, no matter where you run this on DDB, this will give you the uh, entire JavaScript stack. But any JavaScript function does have a point back to where it's called from. But that still leaves other problems. You still have your animations and animators which aren't quite done in the same way. They yeah, don't go through the bindings, uh, it's very difficult to read. So the last thing I want to show how to unbox is QObject Wrapper. And to the wrapper set property, as I say, the properties don't match the QObject properties easily. So you can print QQML property name, and it will tell you the name of the property, and QQML value, QQML data, sorry, can also be in the box. You can print value dot two strip two Q string and that version. And it will print, no matter what type of JavaScript value it is, it will print that in a readable Q string way. And if you know what things is coming into your Q object, you can sometimes see where errors are occurring. Because if this function takes an integer, you'll see something's gone wrong here, you can see there's a string being passed in. So it is useful for debugging of things that Otherwise, you would just see an empty value and it wouldn't work. So, GDB is very useful for this sort of thing. So, the summary is to say GDB is useful, and even on your, where you just have a huge chunk of unreadable JavaScript and QQML, blah, 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 you can extract information. For functions and bindings, we can get this source of the QML. For everything else, it's a lot harder because it gets pre compiled and that information is lost. And even properties can be fetched. And I recommend reading this KDA blog post that talks a bit about, about how binding work. And I'm done.
uh, would you say that the presence of some kernel binding loops uh, is somehow a clue that there are some mistakes on the kernel design? Uh, I don't think how kernel components call the way to so. um, Do you mean if it's a mistake in upstream and queues? Or no, 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 just in, in the order? Yeah. Generally, yes. I haven't seen a case where there hasn't been something quirky. It isn't to say wrong, but it's always that's another way of doing things. And every time it's been fixed, it looks cleaner. Mm -hmm. So, and it's more real. But it's not necessarily a problem. Because we go back to that example where we just have this bonus and mix, where that way we're evaluating it, but it ends up evaluating it. You know it, we know it now, but it re evaluates the same value, and therefore it wouldn't propagate again. But until we looked into it, us, we didn't know it would end up being the same value. And the danger is you miss propagating a set of states, and that kind of thing. So there's something that could be done in Qt to say possibly the one year to see if it, it ended up re-evaluating to something worse. Yeah, that was my follow-up question to what you were saying. Like, I, oh, I, I sometimes find that I have a unique look like you, but when you re-evaluate binding you, it's actually the same value. Yeah. It's, like it's, it's, it's binding, but it's not the stack overflow that happened. So yeah. it's, and it's, it's bad, but it's not terrible. Yeah, okay. I would be happy if you only told me on the table of cases. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you told me then you've already run some JavaScript again, so you, I don't think it's something that could easily be done after you, but you're right. Yeah. But, I mean, the whole GDB part is still relevant for any of these, most even practice. Thank you. What else? Ben? Could you uh, one So if the type of the warning message is generated, couldn't that print the stack trace? I mean, I think it could. Uh, it would mean... It could be a bit because of the microphone. Could have accused the stack trace. And there's actually a lot of port on to, um, where someone's saying it could happen, and there's Simon Carlson's there, and obviously he's a genius. Um, and the problem is you've got a memory of it, you need to keep track of everything. And it, is it worth it? Maybe if it was an uh, optional flag, that can make sense. But I think you still end up in that problem of just knowing your binding trace is useful, it's a very good clue, but sometimes you still need more information. But yeah, I think it could happen as an optional thing, like an environment variable. Yeah. Uh, because you mentioned gamma ray, I did you remember seeing something scroll by about Gamma Ray getting a bindings explorer on um, looking at you? Do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah. Right, uh, Anton is indeed working on that. Uh, I think there's a VIP branch, or a company VIP branch in, in GitHub. Um, the, right now, that still relies on some upstream patches that. Uh, I have video for two um, to get access to dependencies. Um, it's mainly um, showing you the dependencies for the current binding, so that, that of course helps to find out how you got to the, the loop. Um, but it's not yet hooked up to the like bringing to that specific binding when there's a loop. Uh, it's not the stack trace, but it does allow you to step through how bindings all the time. Right, you basically see the dependency tree yeah. for a specific stack. Right. I mean, that's the infrastructure to build more interesting stuff on top of it, um, but we first need to get access to the private class of the private API you know, to do this. Anyone else? 